Hi everyone and welcome. Uh, this is the second webinar we have done during lockdown slash quarantine. And again, we're going to be covering some of the developments around COVID-19. Uh, we're going to be trying to limit this to property and economic uh, impacts only. We're not, none of us are health professionals. At least as far as I know, Pete doesn't look like a nurse. Um, not a nurse. Uh, so we'll, we'll, if, if the questions could be kept to, to property and economics, we, we might stand a chance of um, being able to answer them. And we're going to focus a bit on Wellington. I think looking forward as we do more of these events, we're going to uh, cover off obviously the wider market, but then um, also look at, at a local market. So I've got a nice agenda and I think this will let me click over to it. And for some reason I, I managed to leave it on um, some sort of slick looking appearance, but we're going to run through and introduce ourselves. So who are we? Uh, talk about the recent developments in COVID-19. I mean, everyone's pretty up to speed with the daily announcements, so we won't spend too much time on that. More about what's happening in property and lending. Uh, then we'll dive into Wellington. Um, we're going to talk about basically, and it's we're not super sure um, where, oops, hang on, what's happening? Okay, back, there we go. Uh, where everyone's dialing in from. I'm going to try and run a poll and see if this works. And let's see. Uh, where is No, it actually doesn't let me um, get a poll for where people are dialing in from and you guys to answer it. So perhaps in the chat, if everyone could type in where you're, where you're watching from, and it would give us more of an idea of if we're speaking to uh, Wellingtonians or, um, you know, people from all over New Zealand that we need to cover off, you know, what is the Kapiti Coast and, and how does it, where is it relative to Upper Hutt, et cetera. So we'll talk about the areas, uh, we're going to talk about the economic um, drivers that underpin the Wellington market. Uh, what makes Wellington a bit different from the rest of New Zealand? What makes it the same? Uh, we'll talk about some of the challenges that Wellington faces, uh, that similar to Auckland in many um, respects around difficulty of construction and what that means. Uh, we'll touch on some major infrastructure projects, uh, particularly around uh, Transmission Gully. That's a big one. And and then we'll look forward and it's what we're thinking about what, you know, what's changed with obviously this, what remains the same, um, what are the risks um, and what are the opportunities. And, and it'll be a bit mixed between, you know, the market as a whole and, and Wellington. So Pete, can we start off with an introduction? Tell the good people a bit about yourself. Oh, okay. Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, yeah, I think a lot of you know me or have heard me in the past, but I'm Peter. Um, I've been in, uh, lived in Wellington since uh, 1991, moved from Christchurch. Um, so I'm a full-time, personally, I'm a full-time property investor and trader myself. Um, I'm a property coach and mentor, and I take on uh, private students. Uh, and I do some project management for renovations as well. Um, but predominantly, uh, I, uh, on this call as well, I'm a, f a licensed real estate agent and I'm a property finder uh, for I Find Property. Now, I specialize in the Wellington area, um, uh, specifically about uh, CBD and in, inner city suburbs. Um, but that doesn't stop me going uh, to, the, to the greater Wellington area. But my uh, area of expertise is around um, Wellington Central um, and the uh, inner city, uh, inner city suburbs, uh, predominantly looking at um, good investments such as uh, as yields. So that's uh, just a very ten thousand foot view of who I am and what I do. So, and Pete, you're on the capital. Yes, yeah, vice president of the Capital Property Investors Association as well. So that's uh, I see on the chat here a lot of people are out of Wellington, but that's the um, our local Wellington Association. Uh, we have monthly meetings and get guest speakers and, and monthly sort of fireside chats. And um, we've got a one tonight, actually. Um, we're having a virtual meeting tonight instead of physically getting together 
uh, at the Salvation Army, and uh, we'll be doing a Q&A tonight as well for, for our members. So, yes, busy on that as well, Nick. Yep. All right, so I don't look like I'm a house robber. And Suze. Hey, Hi, Suze. I'm Suzanne Taylor. So, yeah, property investor. Been a trading for about, sure, oh, coming up eight years now. Predominantly in Porirua, but Hutt Valley, Tawa areas as well. And came on board with iFind last year. So a licensed real estate agent like Peter. And, um, you know, so I've got a home staging business and I project manage renovations for other investors. So property, property, property. Talk about oh. property all day. And yes, involved. Yeah. I'll see one of the great things is the, the Capital Property Investors Association, the, the local PIA to, to network. So yes, that's me. All right. So let's jump into the last, uh, I don't know, 72 hours of uh, the, the, the virus and, and, how, and our response and what's, what's moving forward. So obviously everyone knows by now that um, the ground outside is lava game has ex been extended until Monday night. And then we're all allowed outside, except for kind of limited bits and pieces. And uh, be interested in here, and we're still waiting on news uh, from the Real Estate Agents Authority around what activities and how they're going to be permitted, et cetera, and in what way. Uh, any thoughts on developments in the last day or so? And you can throw in anything you've, you've, we've heard about the lending with some news coming across in the last half an hour that the banks are considering, um, well, the Reserve Bank's considering scrapping LBI requirements or reducing them. Yeah, um, look, that's, I think that's um, probably going to get more press than what it's worth, I, I think. I mean, again, um, obviously we'll start with a disclaimer, these are our opinions, we're not so-called experts in what's going to happen in the future because we don't actually know. We know that um, we've seen a lot of these uh, in the past and, um, and we know what will happen uh, long term, but in the short term, you know, it's almost a daily changing basis. But my view on that uh, is that obviously, you know, um, if you're at my last uh, webinar, we, we predicted that this would happen um, because it, it made sense. It was the last sort of bullet left in the gun, as it were. Um, so what it actually means, in my opinion, I haven't done much research on it yet, is that um, although they might be relifting or the LVR restrictions for um, a year, um, I think I think um, that doesn't mean that they, the banks are going to lend any more than what they're lending now, even uh, even less potentially. Uh, each bank will have their own policy as well that they will that they will work to um, their internal policy that not all of us will become aware of. So um, it means it's great from a perspective that some insurance, if you like, is from you know worst case scenario where banks might start to call in some some loans if they ever did that, and I can't see that happening, but. Uh, it protects from that because you know you're within the LVR ranges. Um, I don't think it will stop. Um, ease, I don't think it will ease up money any more than what it currently is with the banks, and that's changing daily on on their own internal lending policies. I think they meet quite regularly around that. Um, and still, we you know if you're an investor or uh, looking to sell one of your properties, or if you've got a few of them, um, you know there's still you know, a chance that the bank won't release all the money anyway if they've got their own internal LBR policies where they want to reduce their exposure across your portfolio. Um, it probably sounds more doom and gloom than what it actually is, but it's just one to make you aware of, um, you know, the, the shortcomings and the pitfalls around around LBR. But it's good news that they've done that, absolutely, from an investor perspective. It gives us a lot of people highly geared, um, and it means that they're not falling outside the reserve banks uh, guidance to the banks. So um, that's, from that perspective, it, it's good. There's a little bit of a safety net. That's just my view on on, on that, Nick, and what I've just seen. Yeah, I think uh, there was a question about whether that's going to apply to investors or, or not. Yeah, I think well. it's across the board. Yeah, I think, yeah. And, and keep in mind, the LVR restrictions, they were, again, they were limited to, you know, the banks were still able to lend 5% uh, for investors above that 70% um, threshold anyway. So that didn't mean that you were strictly at 70%. There was opportunities to go above that um, as well, uh, right up until today. Yeah, I think it's going to be interesting to see what happens because we've had these LVR restrictions, I think, in some form or another since about 2015, 16. So it's been four years. 
And during that four years, there's been a lot of capital growth in most markets in New Zealand. So many people who found themselves caught outside of the boxing ring looking in uh, will have worked hard or have had market growth or both to get themselves to the point where they could buy or can buy at 70%. Now, when those breaks come off, um, it, it, it definitely releases a lot more buyers back into the market, potentially. Uh, banks are also starting to, and this is important if you're watching this, if you had pre-approval before we went into lockdown, you might want to call your broker and, and double check this because banks are starting to look at people and say, look, you need to show that your income is still good um, through this and, and, and obviously after this. And uh, so that's going to cause a bit of frustration uh, for, for, for many. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, I've got a, a working with a client right now. He had a pre-approval um, and um, we're just getting property under contract right now as, uh, in Wellington. Um, and the pre-approval all of a sudden is that, oh, we've now got to go back and reapply for finance. Yeah. Um, and that's happening sort of today. So yeah, uh, thanks for relooking. It doesn't mean she's not going to uh, get it at all. It just means that they're relooking it again and they're basing it on today's income. Mm -hmm. and that's, what, that's your point, Nick. Not, not yep. last year's income, it's today's. So. Yep. So if you're a business owner or a contractor or someone who's just been on pause for three weeks, um, you might have to pause a little bit longer and, and get some paychecks or something in it to show show that you're still good. Uh, and again, guys, if you have any questions about COVID-19 and, and what's happening in the market, et cetera, uh, let us know. Just on the uh, real estate side of things, I think an update a uh, few people have posted about it on Facebook is that uh, there have been statements issued by the Real Estate Institute of New Zealand, which I'll call RINES, which represents all agents, saying that under COVID level three, they expect to be able to do one-on-one um, -on -one real estate services, um, adhering towards the health and safety guidelines. There is some resistance coming in from another body of people called the Real Estate Agents Authority, which is the regulatory body that oversees you know, that good practice. Uh, and they are basically ensure that agents adhere to what's called the real estate agents um rea a real estate agent act 2008 and are either blocking it or requesting changes etc and it's probably going to be another 24 to 48 hours before uh, the public knows what property movement is going to be permissible uh I can't see there'll be a circumstance where builders are allowed to have one or two people in a property doing work and a real estate agent can't have one or two people in a property doing work, but uh, we're still waiting for the official, you know, word to come down. So is there anything you want to add to that? Are you I hearing? Just to brokers, in terms of brokers, I was talking to a catching up with one this morning and he said two weeks ago, one of his clients got a no and same resubmitted yesterday, same circumstances, 24 hour turnaround and a, and a yes. So as I say, week to week, I think they're, you know, it's quite changeable, isn't it, with the banks and their policies and where they're at, new ground for, for everyone. Oh, sorry. Certainly asking more questions, questions around income, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. All right, so let's jump into Wellington. Anyone, just if you've got any questions, chuck them in the, uh, the Q&A feature there. And We'll start with, I think we'll just move up and down the agenda area I've got on my phone here. The, what, the key economic and market drivers. So Wellington's a bit different to other markets in New Zealand in that it is the capital city. So we have, uh, government is an industry in Wellington. And I use we because I invest in Wellington as well. So Pete, perhaps you could talk a little bit about that and what's d different with the property market in Wellington, what impacts it in different ways with, to the rest of New Zealand? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, you're right. It is the capital, I was spotted. Um, look, it's, Wellington is pretty, in my opinion, quite insular from what's happening around the rest of the country. And the, you only have to go back and look at all the property trends over the last um, or 20 years or, or a couple of property cycles, if you like to call it that, um, where our, I guess our increases have been slightly uh, less, if you like, than Auckland. Um, it has caught up, yes, uh, but also our downturns have been less as well because I think Wellington's quite insulated on the fact that what Nick, Nick said, we have central government here um, and traditionally 
Wellington investors do better under a Labour government because uh, there tends to be more um, public sector workers, uh, more demand for people in the city, um, and also uh, the university, the tertiary sector. So Victoria University is a, is a well-known and popular university. A lot of people go through it and send their, their uh, children here as well, and also international students. Um, we can talk about all those sectors if you want it as well, Nick. But so those two main industries, um, uh, you know, the, under, the fundamental underlying um, drivers behind that hasn't changed in, in, in whatever's happening around us with COVID-19. Now, obviously, the universities are shut at the moment, absolutely fully accept that, and we can talk about risks later on, uh, and that's, that's one of the risks, of course, um, around rents, but uh, that's, that's for later in the day. But um, fundamentally, I think, you know, those two primary industries in Wellington, we're not as susceptible as a lot of other areas um, where it can fluctuate based on, on other economic drivers. Um, and, um, you know, there's the hospitality, the, the, you know, including Airbnb and all of those things. Yeah, absolutely, it affects Wellington, of course, like it does everywhere else, but, but not as badly, in my opinion, um, than other areas around the country. So they're the main two drivers, in my, uh, my view. I, I invest around those two areas, so um, because of that, and I've gone through, no, I've been doing investing, so I forgot to mention, for over 21 years uh, around that sector. And, um, you know, my, uh, I think once uh, in the last 20 years, I've had to reduce rents by about 5 or $10 for a few months, and that was about it. Um, so, yeah, it's quite an insular uh, situation, I think, in Wellington, right now. Yeah. And Wellington's not just the city. So, so let's talk a little bit about the surrounding areas up the coast and yeah. the valley. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And obviously, they've, they've sort of inter, started to interline, intertwine a bit more with the, the housing crunch in recent years. Yeah. But, um, you know, Potidur and Kapiti Coast markets are still so buoyant, you know, oh. supply and demand, I guess, you know, we've still got so few houses and so few people wanting to buy up this way, what are doing in the Capita Coast. Um, starting from, a, a, yeah, we're going into this, we into COVID-19 from such a strong position, didn't we, in, in Wellington? Yeah. You know, and that hasn't changed. In fact, gosh, there's you know, even less listings. Um, and uh, agents tell me, you know, the local agents in Potidur and Capita Coast that I look after, yeah. um, that um, there's plenty of people chomping at the bit to, to buy, waiting for this to be over. Have you have you talked to your agents in the last few days? Have they got folks vendors starting to get ready to come on board? Absolutely. There's, you know, we're all waiting to see what's going to happen, what, what we can do in, in level three, as are they. There's, yeah. uh, there's properties ready to come to market. I've got one myself, actually, a, a, a trade. Um, and, yeah, and the, but there's, they've had plenty of query. I mean, the good agents, as you say, some of them I he haven't heard from, but the others that are still active and still still working through this time, they're saying they're, they're certainly fielding queries. Yeah. I guess, you know, the whole city be the same, Pete. You, have you just chatted in with any of your guys in the last few days, Pete? Um, yeah, absolutely. I've also got to mention before about the hospital, which is uh, another big area um, in central Wellington and growing um, as well. So yeah, they're pretty stable areas. Uh, but yeah, as I said, I've had um, a couple of students buy properties during the lockdown and also clients getting properties under contract for clients. So um, there is also that area of expectancy that um, you know property prices are going to go down. Um, I'm, I'm not quite uh, okay. of that uh, mindset yet. I think it all depends on uh, different areas. I think uh, um, you know, as we spoke about before, you can make statistics look like anything you like. So um, I think if people are waiting for the property market to plummet 30%, I I'm, would be sceptical that that will happen. But um, time will tell, I guess. Um, but yeah, look, everyone um, I know is have been looking for properties, are still looking for properties. Um, uh, the, probably the biggest challenge uh, in Wellington investing in the last year or bit has been insurance. Um, that still remains a, a challenge. Uh, and finance, they're probably the, the biggest two challenges at the moment. Um, but um, no, I haven't heard of anyone just um, saying, no, I don't invest anymore. 
people are obviously some people are skeptical they just want to wait and see what happens and that's absolutely fine why wouldn't you uh because you know it's about risk isn't it so um no overall predominantly people are going ho and um my premium buyers are still ringing and asking for properties so, yeah that's it. all right okay next up on my list here i've got my open on my phone and it's still we're still on the wellington fundamental track here oh i do have a question that's coming might be interesting um to, to touch on now since we're talking about the different areas of wellington and it's how do you think tenant building new tenancies will be affected um following lockdown yeah good that is that is a good question um so wellington as i mentioned is is not as bad as other areas from a, for instance like an airbnb perspective and we know that queenstown's down some stupid amount 90 95 percent in auckland as well cbd in auckland uh, is down with airbnb and they're likely to to be flooded a lot with one and two bedroom, predominantly one bedroom, but um, some two bedroom furnished rentals. Um, and again, we all know rents based on supply and demand. Um, and obviously that'll bring quite a high, you know, supply chain to the market. Um, I think that uh, the way we tend to run things in Wellington, and I'm not sure if this is the same all around the country, is that we tend to do tenancy agreements uh, from year to year and I, I, I accept that there's changes afoot with the RTA and that, that's uh, I guess a subject of another webinar on that but um, all I need my a strong tenancy, drink to talk about that one Pat. Yes, yes. All my tenancies and all my students and my clients tenancies are all done on annually from year to year so they, they come up generally about January so from a contractual perspective um, yes we're protected um, there has, you know, I've also reduced rent in one or two of my properties, uh, rent credits, rent holidays, you name it, um, whatever is needed to do to get over the, the roller coaster. I think the risk around um, June, July, if your property becomes vacant, is um, I don't think there's any question they're going to have to take some sort of, um, I guess, discounted rent until you can get through to January and start of the new, new um, uh, calendar year. Um, there's always going to be a demand for housing in, in my, you know, in our view here. So um, if your house is presented well, um, you know, it's up to healthy home standards, if you like, um, but it's got a bit of an outlook, it's got a bit of an outdoor area, you know, and it's presented well, um, I'm sure it'll rent. Um, the question will be how much will it rent for? Um, or is this an opportunity to take that time that you wanted to improve it? maybe do some maintenance or, or some extensions or add a room or change a room or whatever the case may be. So again, I'll take this as an opportunity to um, just reflect on what you've got um, and what are the opportunities going forward to be ready for January next year even. Um, because it may well be this is a good time to, uh, to do some work on the property. But um, yeah, there's always a demand for, for property, in my opinion, Nick, and I think, you know, it comes down to price and supply and demand to be able to get it rented and, and why someone should rent your house over someone else's either better area, better conditions or, or yeah, free or free, free weeks rent. It doesn't matter. It's something like that. Yeah. The, uh, the 12 month fixed cycle, I think for folks watching tends to be stronger in uh, areas around universities yeah. because generally that's when people move in and then, it sort of ripples out because the people who leave university are looking for new homes at the same time and then basically the whole market sort of drifts in line with that so auckland uh central auckland in particular and and then you know in and around those and, and other areas family rentals i think are a bit less affected if you're in tauranga you get there is a bit of a peak summer season but it's more consistent uh, throughout the year someone who's done multiple renovations in wellington i always take a bath for the rest of the financial year on rent that I finish the renovation because I normally finish it in May or June or something or if I've got a crappy build in October one time um, and you just it's just the cost of doing business and then you, you take back on to the next January I do think um, it'll be interesting to see and I don't know how many Airbnbs in Wellington are going to be in the position where they, the numbers are just bad because they're going on to a standard rental I think in some of these resort areas you know, Queenstown is the poster child for this, perhaps up in the Coromandel, some of these beach zones where folks have gone out and bought properties uh, for numbers where if they were at a standard rental, it'd be like a 2% yield. And they only work because they can basically run them as a hotel. And that's going to be different from, I think, a central city, one bedroom, nicely presented apartment. 
you've still got a fundamentally attractive asset as a long-term rental. I think it was Bob Jones who said something in his book, um, square, square shaped, boring houses close to jobs. Um, was basically his, his advice to any residential investor. Um, and then don't, don't go outside of that. Uh, so is your, your properties are a bit, um, probably not like Peter and I plugged into the university timetable. What are you hearing around? Rent? Right, that's right. Yeah, we, it's not so much the, the start of the year, it's an any time, 12 oh. month lease. But um, yeah, we keep them to a high standard, I guess, in a good areas and close to the services. So yeah, we, fortunately, our own portfolio, we haven't had any changes, but yep. we'll talk about it later in terms of potential risks. Yeah, in store, it's a it's a lot supply and demand issue. Certainly, out Porirua, Kapiti Coast, in terms of rentals, it's still at a massive shortage. So, while I've got you on the mic, talk, tell everyone who's watching. I, I think there's a fifty fifty split between locals to Wellington and people that are out of town. Um, let's talk a bit about uh, the infrastructure investment coming in with Transmission Gully because we're so 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 close to it being finished, yeah. <laughs> and everyone got sent home for a month. We thought, we thought, gosh, you know, and I was looking back, it started back in September 2014, Transmission Gully, it's hard to believe, isn't it? Um, and then they were proposing a start, uh, finish date, sorry, completion date of April 2020. Obviously that came out, end of Feb, they came out and said that would be November. And um, yeah, gosh, you wouldn't want to be, there'd be some pressure on those shoulders, wouldn't there, to get that finished now with yeah. you know, five week hold to get it finished. Pub public private partnership, I think the public will be. Underpinning, yeah. underpinning the extra cost there. Absolutely. But, you know, when the announcement came out end of Feb to say it was a, you know, November um, completion date for Transmission Gully, gosh, the Kapiti Coast just went mad again. It was another new flurry of activity up there, what do and Kapiti Coast. Um, but actually, you know, the reality was getting closer, I guess. So there are there... It, no, it's, I'm sort of dovetailing between two items on my list. One of them is the difficulty to build in Wellington, which uh, for those of you familiar with Wellington's topography um, and current construction requirements on foundation, getting something out of the ground in the city is pro prohibitively expensive. It's multiples of six figure to do anything. So typically new construction happens either uh, you know, a small infill development in the city, apartments in the city, or way up north. And this, the way up north part, so in behind Plymouton and the Hutt Valley and, and et cetera, Not further that north. Way up north, come on. Well, you're road. miles out, of, you, you're practically in Levin. 20 minutes up, up the road, come on now. Come on, you're, you're, you're almost in Auckland. And, um, but, how much is that, I think, that the ease of the areas where it's easier to build, uh, finally, Wellington has got the transport links to basically support that pop, pop population growth um, in any areas where you can actually fundamentally build. Absolutely. Finally, a four-lane highway to, all the way to Horofanua. But no, um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens with the new builds, won't it, over the next, the coming weeks and months. I've already had some emails about you guys with... Um, from some of the companies, some of the developers, you know, interest. In oh, you can never get you never get a call back during the hot, the boom times, right? Yeah, exactly. No, exactly. You know, they're uh, they're making contact now. Yeah, mm -hmm. must be hurting. Yeah, yeah. The um the good thing about the CBD, if you like, is that we are landlocked a little bit in Wellington. You can't really um uh, unless you change the infill rules, um, you can't really do much inside Wellington. So. Um, obviously, being an earthquake area as well, there's, there's height restrictions as well. So land becomes more valuable as more people can't move into this, you know, Wellington. I think we grew 1.5% population last year. So um, everybody wants to live near work, I guess, um, or in the city. Um, so that just puts more demand on the land. So, um, you know, there, there's, there may be a change to district planning. There may, there may not be, who knows. But um, we know that, you know, there's, there's not a lot of land around the, the middle of Wellington, um, inner city, and even a lot of outer city suburbs um, to be able to, uh, to build. And the build costs can be quite high because it's not flat land, as you, I'm sure you all appreciate. Um, uh, I'm looking at a build that's right opposite the university, um, but it's quite a steep piece of land, and I've got a, a, 
a property on there now and are looking to build a six bedroom on the front. Um, you know, we're talking uh, potentially up to a million dollars of build and, and a lot of that will be just getting out of the ground and yeah. council and all that stuff. So um, hence, you know, the, you, it needs to be viable because the rents are higher for sure, but um, the cost of building in Wellington is very, very restricted. Inner Wellington I'm talking about um, as well. So, and as Susie said, as you go out a little bit, there's, there's a lot more land available, uh, but uh, what's happening to existing developments and people wanting to develop, I think that's a big, uh, big, big question actually say at the moment. Yeah, well, yeah, it's in any area of uncertainty. I think that's people. Well, speculation, right? That that folks pull back. One last thing on on building um, infrastructure around buildings, such as water. You know, I understand that the inner city has some constraints, uh, slightly older pipes than they should have, and it, there's some work, well, probably some 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 finger pointing being done at council to. Um, improve the situation or is it are they just talking about it um so you're yeah, talking about wastewater look they, they've all wellington's outsourced everything they don't do anything themselves um in that respect um, um so they brought a um, a regulation in a few years ago that if you're doing developments um your uh water that's coming off your property needs to be at the same rate if you're doing it in a city development which means you actually when you build a new house on an existing section an additional house or dwelling um, you've increased the roof space so you actually have to put in holding tanks uh, as well and that, that can add oh, ten thousand if not more to uh, to your costs so you have to hold the, your water before you're able to um, use uh, get into the mains for, for waste uh, uh, um, Stormwater, big part. Stormwater is what I'm trying to say. Until you try to get into stormwater, because they want the rate, because the infrastructure can't cope with the, with that. So, you know, I, I, you know, they're way behind the board. I, I can't see that changing for quite some time. But it does add cost for development as well. Um, it's based on the roof space. So, I mean, I'm, I, long story short, the inner city has got a lot of constraints, uh, cost constraints. Area I've been through the district plan. I mean, most most sites uh, you you're very limited on the, on ground coverage. Uh, you're limited on narrow lots, um, boundary rules, building envelopes. It's very very yeah. difficult to do a whole lot. Yeah, uh, the height yeah. plans get you even though you might be up a mountain. It still has to be within you know a meter or three meters of the boundary and 45 degree angles that type of thing. Yeah. So yeah, they still apply. Unfortunately, there's there's not a lot of uh, well, I was going to say common sense, but there's not a lot of, um, I guess... Oh, go on, you could say okay. I'm thinking it. <laughs> thinking about uh, the impact of one house versus the other and how the height planes may or may not change based on um, oh. heights, you know, um, high, um, ground levels. Oh, yeah. No, I, I remember having to put it in a fireproof wall because I moved the door one foot to the left or something during a... Yep. It's the windows, it's the fireproof windows, which are the difficult things if you're within a metre of the boundary, even though the boundary might be... You know, even though your house is made of 100-year-old wood. Fireproof the windows will outlive us all. So, looking forward, guys, uh, Wellington investment, well, property investment generally, and, and I'll, I'll start with you, Suze. Um, what do you think has changed in, in your own investing strategy in, in, in the market? What's, what's the same? Yeah, are you doing anything differently right now than you were doing three months ago? He's hesitating about trading. <laughs> going forward, you know, hesitating about, I guess we just don't know where prices are going to end up, do we? Yeah. So hesitating on, on that a little, whereas we've been, you know, rolling those out for the last sort of seven or eight years. Um, and that's because you're buying and selling in the same market to make trading yeah. profitable. And we do turn them over quickly, but yeah. still, you know, things are, things are changing, you know, you just don't know whether yeah, there is going to be a, a downward drop and if so, how much. Mm. So just holding back on that trading, although as I say, we've got one going to market as soon as we get to. to oh, me too. We'll, we'll swap stories. Yes, time will tell. Mm. So, if trading is going to be choppy, talk, let's talk a bit about buy and hold. Uh, for you, what are you thinking about the buy and hold fundamentals? Yeah, well, first of all, yeah, we're freeing up money to, to increase buy and hold, certainly. I mean, again, maybe some potential risk around rent or rent dropping. Again, in the area we're looking at, this again, it's just supply and demand. You know, there's still quality rentals, good quality rentals are, are still sought after 
absolutely. Did you, I don't know if Wellington is the same, because I started investing in Wellington 2015 as the city was coming out of the GFC. Uh, before that, I was investing in Bay of Pliny, and I noticed in the, in the cheaper areas in particular, it was the houses that, the crappier houses. Uh, you couldn't almost drop your prices enough when, when there was the, the supply demand dynamic was flipped over. The, the nicer houses all got rented out, and just the, the rubbish stuff, you, you had to really compromise on, you know, who you, you put in your house and, and what you're able to charge and, and, and et cetera. Is, is, you, is Polydor and in, in parts, of, in the, particularly out of the suburbs in Wellington, the same? Yes, yeah, they are. I guess there's, there's less of those lower level properties and gosh, the, the money they can get for them, we can get for them now compared to five years ago, as you never thought you'd yep. see it. <laughs> you know, in, the, in Polydor East and some of those parts. Um, deepest, darkest. Huh? deepest darkest parts. <laughs> no, I didn't say. Different parts of uh, Porirua East. You know, gosh, they're, they're still getting over $500 for an extremely basic property. So, yeah. You know, it's still a, a big waiting list and a big shortage of, of properties. Yeah, I don't think that waiting list is getting any shorter. In fact, no. it, you know. Um, the, the last five weeks wouldn't have helped it. No. 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 Um, Pete, how about you? Um, slightly different view on um, why I invest, in, I guess, and in, in, in the clients that I work with. We're very much focused on cash flow um, and yield. Um, I consider equity and price growth, if, if, if you like, to be a byproduct of the yield that I'm getting. Um, and I'd like to find properties that are going to produce me a positive cash flow after all expenses. Um, and so to me, it doesn't matter if property prices go up and down on paper um, in the short term. Long term, obviously, you all expect them to go up and that's how you build your wealth over a long period of time, I guess, um, and be able to leverage off that um, equity to, to help you with another deposit to go forward. But I'm a believer of um, finding a property where I can add value to so I can increase the yield. And then, the, you know, as I said, the equity will follow that. Um, so um it's more of the same to me to me this is a great opportunity because you know if the pundits are right then we're going to have less demand for those properties there's going to be more of that type of property that i'm after on the market potentially uh, and they're going to have less demand so to me it's a perfect opportunity to to seize on this to look for what i'm looking for for me and also for my clients um so i'm actually approaching up with a pretty positive attitude really well, we'll have to wait and see and every area will be different um, so I think it's important to reassess what you're trying to get out of property and what areas may fulfill that need for you um, as you move um, as you move forward um, and for me I'll be looking at, in town at CBD um, for student young professionals that type of person there the originals uh, you know the, the, the for demand there the houses, standalone houses, um, with some land. It's um, it's a recipe that has worked for me for 20 years, and I'll carry on doing that. And um, you know, as I said, if my property price goes down 10%, it doesn't matter if I'm still getting cash every week and I'm living off that. So, don't worry about it later. Don't worry about it later. But that's just my view on it. So, just for yield, Nick. Well, no one ever went broke with too much income in debt. Yeah. Yeah, I think. Um, I mean, I, I find property if that. Folks on our who've been on our list mailing list for a while will we'll, we'll know that every property we've put out has been either cash flow neutral or better since I think the dawn of time. Mm. Um, that's certainly not going to change. I do think there's going to be less competition from people who are speculating on price uh, oh, yeah. and good riddance because <laughs> we can go out and get the properties. Um, but Pete, you also do trading. Do you do your thoughts on trading um, line up with Sue's and, and that's just a yeah, courses. it's a bit of a hurry up and wait. Um, yeah, we don't know. I mean, I can't, it's hard to see right now from where I'm sitting, um, property prices going up. It's just because um, you're sitting in the mountains of Hawaii, Pete. I'm sitting on top of uh, <laughs> Mount um, um, Tongariro. Yes. Oh, looking sorry. up Ruapehu here and, uh, and, sorry, looking up Narahara and Ruapehu. Um, it's a fine day for a change up there. So yeah, look, um, trading, um, I'm luckily, I have got no active trades at the moment. Um, um, but you know, it's hard to see property prices going up. So time isn't your friend in that respect. Um, 
but again, you know, there's going to be opportunities. I think, um, you know, with KiwiSaver going down, I mean, you know, you woke up one day and your KiwiSaver had gone down 20%. Uh, pretty sure your house price didn't go down 20%. But, um, you know, so it's going to make it harder for first-time buyers to get into housing. Um, although I have to process the LVR changes today, what, what that will do. Um, that would probably fix it. Possibly, uh, depending on the bank's individual criteria. Yeah, but, service um, in place. Yeah, so, so that's really a supply and demand. And what, that, what, what will that do? Because I found that, you know, the, the bottom end of the market, you know, that, you know, you're, we're getting up to 550, 550,000, sometimes 600 for first-time buyers. Uh, have the ability to get that um, and it'll be interesting to see what happens to that level of the market. Um, so, you know, buying a house and needing to do up and then selling to a first home buyer is still a really good trade because the first home buyer, in my opinion, can get into their house, but then they haven't got any money to do the renovation. Um, well, they can't borrow that money, you know what I mean? So yeah. having a, here's a really nice house I can get in, just go live, to me, that has appeal. So I wouldn't say I would stop trading. I would say I'd be very super spent and do my homework a lot better than what I would have done a couple of months ago, should we say. Yeah, I think also we're going to stabilise around some kind of new normal very, very quickly. Um, it, it's when the change happens that it's, it, it's difficult. You hear about people who, uh, well, and, and again, I think trading, uh, if you're selling properties, and, and uh, most traders, I think, do this too, home buyers, first home buyers, uh, middle to lower end of the market, middle ma market. It, it, it's a very different kettle of fish than if you're million dollar, six month renovations needing $1.3 million or something. Mm. Mm. Uh, and I think the most traders that I know of do the former, but there are certainly people out there doing the bigger projects, which when they come off, they're great. Uh, that's going to be a, a, a tricky situation though. Yeah, it'd be very interested to see what happens to that end of the market. I mean, you'd expect that there would be some movement down on the very high end of the market uh, based on, um, I guess, unemployment and salary cuts, uh, the like in the short term for executives or high salary people. Um, uh, so it'd be very interesting to see that, you know, I can see the bottom end of the market going down a little bit and I can see the top end coming down as well. Um, uh, and obviously, you know, just pressure. It's just unemployment. The longer it goes on, of course, the worse it gets um, because of the pressure on unemployment and salaries. Mm. That's, that's the biggest difference I think here uh, than previous, than the, the, la than the last one, uh, the last uh, the GFC, um, uh, where it was more about stability of the banks, um, more so than this one, which is about stability of income of jobs. Um, so it's a slightly different dynamic. End result will be the same, um, mm. a, a different dynamic to think of. So risks around obviously unemployment. Um, I mean, that the risk has already arrived in some sectors. Uh, Wellington, less so than others, although, you know, within Wellington, there's, there's industries the same as anywhere else that's been impacted, such as hospitality. Um, opportunities are, you know, definitely in, in, in securing properties with good cash flow with reduced competition from buyers. Uh, you know, properties coming on the market and just, you know, uh, having more time to access them without going to crazy offers, etc. So really, it's a good time to be buying as a buy and hold investor. And then the trading game will plateau at some point, and then that, that will, people will just kick on doing that. Yeah. Uh, interesting that the the, the drop in Kiwi Saver, everyone was predicting that was going to take first time buyers out of the market, but this LVR change is probably going to. Correct that, Shep. Assuming, like you said, the bank's own rules don't don't stop them. Yeah, it's also the um, the little factor about their wage and salary. What what's going to happen there? Yes. Um, and that's um, you know, if unemployment does go up to ten percent, I don't know. I have no idea if it will or won't. Um, you know, that will that will change some some people in the market. There's no question about that. Um, yep. No question about that. But you know, traditionally in the times like that, though, as we know, um, Nick, the previous one is that there was a surge, if you like, and not just online learning, but university enrollments, um, with people getting re-educated. And, and we can sort of get a feel that that may happen. Um, you know, the government's talking about massive infrastructure projects. Um, they're talking about some developers maybe not getting through this. So there's going to be some repurposing or retraining of people as well um, to be able to 
fulfill these infrastructure projects because there's certainly not enough people to do it. Um, and, um, you know, in the short term, builders will certainly be under pressure. I mean, supply chains are. It's all very well turning the tap on again next Tuesday for builders, but there's no stock inside Bunnings and Mitre 10 and placemakers. So getting that ramped up is going to be a problem. Um, so, you know, I, I think there could be, again, um, you know, what we lack in overseas students coming in may well pick up the slack with um, local, local students, if you like. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've already started to see offshore marketing around sending your children to New Zealand. Mm. You know, it's you, you come in, you go into a, a, a hotel for two weeks at this stage, and then you get your kids in a in at Wellington University as opposed to at New York State. Mm. Definitely, it definitely appeals at this time. Uh, and I'll add to the university thing: there was a big surge in university numbers during the GSC. People uh, teaching. Uh, te the, the teacher shortage might be about to um, solve itself. That was definitely popular in the last recession as folks um, sought, um, uh, what is it, uh, assurance, reassurance, uh, something, safety, uh, uh, and, and employment. And university, at least, I, I don't know how many years it is now, it was the first year, it might even be the second year, uh, the fees are free. So, you know, a lot of people, the, the economic cost to even go and do this uh, retraining during um, a time like this is, is less. It's easy to go and, and, and start to look at other fields. Uh, and I think another one that'll get a big bump is going to be IT. Because, uh, you know, firms who have web-based IT services, selling services online or, you know, developing for offshore multinationals are still at home, plugged into the computer working. So, look, I just see a question come up I wouldn't mind answering as well. Um, go for it. From Anonymous. So, hello, Anonymous. Um, what are your thoughts on apartment investing in the city? Um, really good question. It really depends on where you are in your investing life and what you are trying to achieve. Um, um, my thoughts only, uh, not rules, is that you know if I was young and if I was younger uh, and starting out, I'd be wanting land um, more so um, because I think land is what appreciates because of the scarcity of it um, in Wellington anyway. Um, and I wouldn't be looking at apartments. However, in saying that, I've sold a number of um, dual key apartments where you've got two um, two rental incomes off one title, as it were, and positive cash flow. Um, so for uh, someone who's just after cash and yield, wanting um, a weekly income, they can be very, very good because they're gonna give you that income. Um, the problems with apartments, of course, you can't really control the body corporate and predominant cost in the body corporate is around insurance and your long-term maintenance plan. Um, and if that includes any weather tightness or earthquake issues. Um, so I'm more in control of my property than I am of an apartment. But I'm saying that if you do your homework, there are some good yields to be made off apartments. Um, I've currently got two off-market deals on apartments that are uh, around 6% net yield. That's after all costs. Um, not bad when interest rates are three. Not bad when interest rates are three. I understand that. Um, so I guess Nick, you helping you with the math. If yeah. anyone's interested in those, I, I mean, I haven't taken the contract. I'm just being offered them up. So if, if anyone's interested in off-market um, apartments, uh, it's not something I personally push. But if someone was interested, then I can um, I can make the deal happen uh, in in town. So that's my view on apartments. You may have a different deal. I know there's people in Auckland that just buy apartments and specialise in apartments. Um, and they do quite well, um, but um, yeah, anyway, I'm just giving you what my view is and I'm happy to take questions or comments. I'll check on with my view on apartments and how I've always talked about them and thought about them is it's a way to get into a very central location at a fraction of the price um, and you can earn a similar rent, so it is a cash flow investment because uh, you're not buying the land so you're not having to pay for the land. You don't get the growth. The growth from the land, um, your growth will typically be around, you know, be some market gains, but also around rent increases, etc. And then I'd add that to anything that's built for purpose. So you'll see properties that are four flats, four one bedroom flats, and that's a cash flow investment. You know, as the rents grow up, you'll, 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 um, your 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 property will be worth more. Uh, studio developments. We've got three bedrooms in a house that are sort of rent by their own. They've got their own little 
um, en suite and the kitchenette, those are very, very strongly tied to rent. You know, these dual key apartments is never going to become a family home for three, for a wife and husband, wife and two kids. So it, it's a cash flow buy, you buy it for cash flow, you and and that's that's fine if that's what you want to do. There's, I don't think there's a super. You just need to be aware of what you're not buying when you do that, and you're not buying the ground with the ability to control it and redevelop it, and repurpose it, etc. Hmm. Uh, one other question: um, If LVR rules are removed and I buy a property at a high LVR, money is the example, and after they put the LVR rules back in, can they call in my loan? Now this normally hasn't happened um, because uh, it would be some political fallout uh, <laughs> if it did. Um, when the LVR rules came in in 2015, for example, and suddenly people had 20% deposits and all of a sudden they were told they needed 40 or 30, depending on when it was, what happened was that uh, you couldn't then go and buy again. Uh, so if you wanted to, if you bought it 90% and a year later you've saved up another 10% or something uh, and they've dropped it to 80, the banks will say, no, you need 20% deposit for your next property. And if you're doing it with the first property, you need 20% for both. So you suddenly need to go and get a whole lot of extra capital, either as equity in the property or as cash uh, to borrow that and, and buy that property. Any thoughts on that one, Peter? Yeah, there, 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 there is a, is a risk. Um, first of all, I mean, if you read all your mortgage documents, um, the banks, I think, they keep the right to be able to call in any time anyway, but they're unlikely to do that. Um, but if you're at 90% LVR, which is highly leveraged, um, when you come to refix or, or wanting to buy another house, you know, your income, well, your serviceability income will be um, gone through the, the calculator to see whether they will um, lend you any more money um, uh, and what terms you might get on the money you've already owned. I mean, if you can't, if you have a good habit of paying all your mortgage and everything on time, I can't see any reason why you know, the banks are in the business of lending money. That's what they do. So I don't see any issue. I think um, one of the, big, the, the biggest issue will be around if you've got multiple properties and you're trying to sell one expecting to keep that uh, equity to be able to either live off or whatever, um, that bank, if you're with the same bank, is likely, again, you'd ask the bank before you wanted to sell that property, would be likely to keep the equity gain from there to offset against that 90% to reduce that LVR to be a more comfortable investment for the bank. Um, so if you are looking to sell one of your properties in a bank that owns more than that one, I would always, or through your broker, request what will happen when you sell that property uh, before you go and do it. You don't want to be in a situation where you sold it to get money and at the end of the day, that money doesn't come to you. It goes to the bank to reduce the LVR on the other property. You can go and talk to a broker and ask them to sit, move that property to another bank. Uh, and it was done when the LVR increases came in originally and it's called a one-to-one -one swap where you take that property with the servicing and everything in place and you move it to another bank it was permitted and then if it's the only property that that second bank has uh, many brokers reported being able to execute a sale uh, for clients in those circumstances and it, I think that just again highlights um, the value of working with teams who understand property investment instead of going direct to the bank direct to the insurer uh, etc I have another question uh, Sue, I'm going to throw this your way first. Uh, do you think it will be easier to buy high yielding properties going forward? Get your crystal ball out, Sue, then. Tell us what you think. You think it won't be easier to buy high yielding? High, yield, high yielding properties. So um, I, I guess that means will rent stay the same and values go down? Mm. <laughs> crystal ball, isn't it? You know? um, what do you think? Who knows? God, I'd hope so. Where, you know? But Whereas buyers agents would be would be onto that. Yeah, exactly. Okay. I think um, um, interest rates have dropped. So yeah. let's let's remember that your net cash flow exactly. has already improved. You're borrowing yeah. at an all time low, aren't you? Uh, yeah, I think Nick. Um, I mean, seven percent with interest rates at three and a half percent has been the benchmark that I've been looking for in Wellington anyway, um, and. No, you can't buy 7%, but you, and a lot of times, can create 7% by 
changing the property. As I was mentioning earlier, adding improvements to increase the yield with through whether it be a bedroom or a second bathroom or even a deck in some cases. So depending on the type of investment you're getting it, um, to create that yield. I like to look at things as not so much what the yield is it, is it what are my current, what's the current interest rate and can I beat that by 3% or 3.5% if you stretch back, but say 3%. So, um, because it's giving me a nice margin and a bit of a safety net. So if interest rates are 3%, really, you know, 6% is, is not a bad target because you know you're going to be cash flow positive in that. And that's the type of thinking that, that I do around that. Um, will it be easier to get, you know, 7% is a number. The question is, can you be positive cash flow in an area where there's likely to be capital appreciation over a period of time? It's probably more the question I would I'd be wanting to answer as opposed to a specific 7%. But, but my, my, I guess my guidance is, Pick a, a, a margin between the, your interest rates that you're paying and the yield that you want, and use that as your guide. Yeah, no, that, I, I look at properties based around cash flow and able to recycle equity. I don't uh, ever focus on yield. If you're buying a property to add value, I think you focus on the end value uh, and um, in cash flow. So again, this comes back to lack of competition um, in the market. So, I you mean, know, just for everyone watching, typically what Peter does and with his clients is they go and find properties that they pay. The price they pay for the, uh, the house is, is almost irrelevant because we're only really looking at once some work has been done and often these projects are significant value add, what, what's the yield looking like and what's the cash flow looking like and what's the equity gain looking like coming out the other side. Uh, and this, if you can if you think along these times lines when you're looking at any property any market in New Zealand for existing you're going to find value in the market uh, and right now when half of the buyers are worried about a plus five or ten percent swing a uh, uh, drop if you're going in thinking well I can add 20 percent value then who cares um, what yield etc it's I think it's going to be great uh, in terms of just no, no competition from buyers, very low interest rates. Uh, still 40 odd thousand houses short in just about any market in New Zealand and around the, the central areas. Um, so I, I agree with you 100% on that, Pete. Uh, question for Sue, uh, on supply and demand issues, Petoni Lower Hut, uh, is, is, are the constraints similar in the hut than they are over by the uh, by potty door. Is there a huge demand for property? What do you think of that overall in the very area as investment? Still very big constraints to get in the hut valley. Um, you know, the yields were getting over there even, what did I do, one twelve, just over 12 months ago. Um, gosh, the prices have just increased. And again, uh, rental numbers, rentals are um, at a shortage over there as well. So, so hard, harder to find opportunities, but certainly there are opportunities in the, in the Hutt Valley, the wider Hutt Valley as well as, yeah, Potero Capital Coast. Yeah, there was it's a real... Oh, it's really changed over there, Susie, hasn't it? It's um, yeah. a lot of first home buyers are going over um, places like Stokes Valley. Um, I've got property in Stokes Valley, of course. Um, and you know we've seen a trend where people can't buy properties in Johnsonville and uh, moving over to Stokes Valley for goodness sake. And um, during the downturn, uh, while I've been home doing very little in the last four weeks, um, I've looked at doing a development in Stokes Valley on a piece of dirt that I own, um, putting five townhouses on. And um, you know I've sent it to a trusted real estate agent and a rental, and uh, the numbers they're coming back with are phenomenal. What they're worth pre-COVID for sure, but. Um, yeah, quite surprising how that market's really taken off, isn't it? It's it's it's, um, it's hard to find a, a bargain over there. No, oh, absolutely, absolutely. That market surged in the last nine months. I think September last year, the, the banks eased their servicing requirements and interest rates dropped five percent, and it was like rocket fuel. Mm. Uh, and interest rates have just dropped another half percent, but obviously there's something opposing the rocket fuel now. So it'll be very interesting to see what happens. I think I'll chip in here and just give a bit of anecdotal uh, counterpoint to the values dropping argument, or at least in the immediate term, and that's the mortgage deferrals. Um, 
because when the mortgage deferrals they came out and a lot of people were saying oh you know, at first they called it a repayment holiday which caused all sorts of problems and then some very quickly a lot of brokers did good analysis saying look it's a, it's a terrible option you're you're adding an extra, a lot of extra cost down the line you should keep maintaining your mortgages as you go if you can uh, on any course and i thought oh yeah fair enough read the articles made sense now, i talked to a friend the other day who's taken one and i bit my tongue from pointing out the maths and he said, look, I'm out of work for three months, um, but then I'm back in. He's a builder, so he's, he's probably back in next week. Uh, I've got, he had $250,000 owing on his house. He took a three-month holiday. I don't know how long he's got on his year. We didn't really dig into it. He said, it's going to add $3.50 to the cost of my mortgage for the rest of life. I don't have to worry about it for the next three months. I'm going to keep my house. Family has a place to live. So people are approaching mortgage deferrals, not looking at, total lump sums or anything. It's the same way they're looking at what house they can afford to buy on their weekly repayments. And that's why there's, I think they've seen 80,000 people take these up, uh, which blew everyone away. But everybody's looking at this and saying, well, I can have no, no housing stress for the next three to six months for the, cost, for the price of one or two cups of coffee a week. And I, I think that's gonna, under, that's gonna, if there is a drop coming uh, in, in values, surely this is going to help soften that uh, in the immediate term until more and more people are back at work and, and the economy is starting to obviously come out the other side of this. This logic of the day from Nick. Yeah. Uh, Pete, does that make sense? Yep, yep, I understand. Um, yep, uh, it's hard to know exactly what coming out of this means. That's all, okay, particularly with our cut. So. Um, yeah, it's a hurry up and wait thing, but I mean, the economy's starting to be turned on hopefully next Tuesday, so yeah. um, we'll go from there, I think. But um, there's a few questions there, we can look through those. Yeah, let's work through these. So, we'll give it five more minutes, I think, and we'll work through the questions. So, quick answer, rapid fire. Um, yeah. All right. Um, uh, would you tend to avoid poor areas that have high yields and sacrifice capital gains, or do you still see these areas as good opportunities? Pete? Oh, you've skipped questions. No, I'm coming back to them, don't worry. Okay, so would I avoid areas, say that again, sorry? That... Uh, poor areas, so lower socioeconomic areas with yep. high yields. Yep. Um, do you avoid them? Um, or do you still see these as good opportunities? Oh, tough question. Everyone's got their own rules. Um, Susie will be diff completely different to me. Uh, my, <laughs> so you might want to get both our opinions. I will be. Uh, I tend to, I do tend to avoid them. Um, not for other strategies, um, but for buy and hold. Um, I... I do tend to avoid them because um, I like the fixed term tendencies. Um, I have more chance, probability only, of getting all my rent on time each week uh, with students, young professionals in town than I do um, in those type of areas. Uh, also, you know, a 7% yield in Pari Lua, say, might not give you cash flow positive where a six and a half percent yield in the middle of town may well give you cash flow positive, um, purely because you know the rates and the insurance. You know, if you think about how many weeks rent does it take just to pay the rates of insurance, that could be 10, 12 weeks in in Porirua. It's probably two to three weeks in the city. So that's why there's a big disparity around these gross yields. So I, as you could tell, I was reluctant to talk about gross yields too much because every house is different. But um, I do tend to look at an area where um, there's going to be demand down the track, I think, to increase to help um, property prices. And in the meantime, I can still make cash flow. Um, that's not to say you won't get an increase in Paru, because most certainly there has been in the last few years. Um, probably see that quite flat for the next little while. And then again, but I'll let Susie give her opinion as well. In fact, yeah, Susie, the so lower. Northern suburbs. Susie's is frozen for me. Is she frozen for you, Pete? Yes, yeah, she's um, she's not moving. She's statue. <laughs> she's not moving. I might just quickly pop her on mute if I can. Um, it's going to work. We might. We'll come back to Sue's. Hopefully, yeah, you can answer the question here. Um, so I'll add to that question just on that is that the poor lower socioeconomic areas all rocketed up in value as well. Um, so uh, if you are looking just at values, that's, that's a big generalization when people say capital growth versus none. 
but there's certainly other uh, pros and cons about these areas, such as, such as um, regularity of getting rent, maintenance, uh, amount of turnovers, vacancies, etc. So if you are going into those poorer areas, I would go a little bit above the bottom in terms of quality at least and make sure you've got a nice house because if uh, a market ever does turn into an area where there's more tenants and uh, uh, more houses than tenants, you don't want to be the last cab off the oh. rank. Uh, good question. Student so rentals. Yeah, so David's on student rentals. Um, a couple of things to uh, think about, uh, David, and everyone, everyone else who's interested in student rentals is that, um, uh, how will they be affected? Yeah, good question. Um, well, we know that the student allowance hasn't gone down. It's still as it was, 250 a week-ish, um, depending on where you are, or 230. Um, so we know that their income stream of students will remain the same. A lot of them do, um, I guess, augment their salary, their allowance with, with part-time work and hospitality or tourism or whatever the like. Um, and that's certainly dried up. So it will put pressure on the high-end uh, market for sure because of um, at the moment there there are other sources of income um, have dried up um, and um, also um, you know the certainty about going back into the university um, under level three you know you can have maximum class sizes of 10 and you know there's a lot of universities talking about not opening up to level two uh, and gearing themselves up to open in June and semester two so um, what will that do I mean I think students are you know, pretty resilient and they want to get on and do their work. Um, so there's the, there is the gap between now and when students come back in earnest. I mean, I've got a lot of student rentals. A lot of them are, uh, well, some of them are vacant now as students move back to their families, are uh, still paying the rent um, with the view that they're going to come back as soon as the lockdown's lifted. So it is a watch this space. I'd also add that um, a lot of the international students will probably still come given that we're deemed to be a safe haven and do their isolation. But they tend to also stay in the halls of residence. First year students tend to be in the halls of, of residence where the market I look at for student rentals, I tend to look for year two onwards and young professionals. So, uh, because I know that, you know, 60 or 70% of the first year students don't go back to um, year two anyway. So that's not a market that's probably going to impact me uh, and, and a lot of my um, clients and students. Um, um, but I, I still think there'll be more of a need for flats because of what's happened even with coronavirus and also some other, you know, unfortunately some other suicides as well in the halls where you've got a large number of people in a confined space. So there's probably going to be more demand even for a smaller amount of people in flats, um, I'd imagine, um, more so um, than, than, than the halls, in my opinion. I'm a glass half full type of guy. All right. Let's uh, two more questions, and then I think we will we'll wrap it up. Uh, and Suzanne, you back with us? Yeah. All right. So, what are the impacts of high rates on the Potidua area properties? Uh, are other areas in Wellington much lower for rates? Um, and is there just a general like ratio, I guess, with percentage of the, the hmm. value or something? I mean, investing in Potida, you do have to factor in the higher the higher rates, absolutely, than than Wellington City and the Kapiti Coast. We just factor those in, into the numbers, though. You know, we're still getting, you know, so high rents, good numbers, and like Pete says, you know, we're, what I'm looking for for my clients as well is that adding value. You know, we've been, and we has been for the last couple of years. You know, it's properties where we can add value and we we factor all the costs in, and we've certainly still been finding you know, cash flow positive properties of late um, in the, in the Porirua area and up the coast? Yeah, so it's certainly a factor, but I think you, you've hit it on the, hit the nail on the head and that you know the numbers when you start, when you buy the house. Yeah, Don't yeah. make the thing, it's, it's yeah. Yeah, one, of the, one of, a downside of, of Porirua City, but it's not bare one end on, it doesn't make it unaffordable. Mm. Yeah, the insurance one is interesting. I had a look at my insurance invoices from three years ago the other day for some reason and shed a tear. <laughs> Nostalgia. <laughs> yeah. Got a factor that in too, don't you? Oh yeah. But um let's move on to the last question and it's just a general question. Uh and so Pete, I'll let you field this one. It's just and let's make it an open strat strategic question for the next two years. So it's about interest only in P and I. Oh, so obviously yeah. the eternal debate. Um but 
looking if, if let's tie it back to strategy so buy and hold investment for the next 90 days what 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 do you what what would you be talking oh, about? Geez, you? Nick, you know you can. We, You're we, a financial advisor. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm not a financial advisor, so um, disclaimer, disclaimer, uh, warning, warning. Um, gee, we could have another an hour on this or two. Okay, well, let's. Um, let's, let's so let's look, <laughs> I, you know, if you're obviously part of the property chat group and, and Graham's group, he's he's very simple minded as far as it's got to be principal and interest to pay it down. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that strategy, and it works obviously very well. Uh, versus the other side of thing, let's just be interest only. Uh, and that works if you are disciplined and you can manage your finance as well. And you manage your principal repayments as it were via your revolving credit. So you manage it instead of the bank. But ultimately what you're trying to do is pay off your mortgages to increase your equity. So the end goal remains the same. How you get there might be slightly different in your strategy. Given these times right now, and the banks are offering up the ability to go from principal and interest to interest only, um, I, you know, I think that's worth considering to help with your cash flow over the next little while. Uh, if there's pressure on rents, then obviously your biggest cost is your interest, then why not take that opportunity to, to ease that pressure on you by, you know, by um, uh, going from moving from P&I to interest only. If you don't need to, then don't. If it's business as usual, that's fine. But I, I don't think there's a right and wrong answer here. I think there's two schools of thought and they both have merit uh, and you can work with them both. Uh, you know, very diplomatic answer, Nick, but no, it's there is no diplomatic. It's extremely diplomatic. I think the way I think about it is uh, generally is if you go on interest only, like Peter said, you need to not touch the money. Yeah. Um, it, 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 unless, but it does give you control. So if you want to go into a renovation or a redevelopment or something and you need some cash and you've got the cash in your bank account and you can go and get it and do the thing, if you paid it back, you have to go ahead and hand to the bank and ask. And to me, that's that's the big difference. Um, last question, and yeah. it comes from a very suspicious uh, individual, um, Mr. Adam Coburn. Um, I'm not sure who let him in. Someone sent him the webinar by mistake. Adam's a good friend of us all. He's, he's uh, I think he co-runs with you, Pete? Oh, uh, yeah, he's a monk. The, the PIA as well? He is the president of the capital PIA. Yeah, fearless leader. Fearless. Uh, so uh, Adam's asked, um, what sort of properties are you buying in capital? And what sort of projects are you needing to do in order to achieve positive cash flow? So I'll throw that open there. So what I've been looking at for um, for my clients up in Cabot Coast is is multi income units. Uh, hard to get any, the numbers to work on any standalone properties, um, even in the interesting parts of Ortaki. So yeah, multi units, yeah, original condition, or ones with existing tenants, or maybe Housing New Zealand, or you know something in there where um, you know it's a bit of a twist. But they're very few and far between uh, at the moment. I don't know have been for a while up there. Properties with stuff you can do, yep. as opposed to properties adding, where the stuff has been adding done. Value, adding, absolutely, adding value or multi-income if possible. Yeah, multi-income I think has been a constant theme for us in the last year uh, nationwide as yields have come down and values have gone up. Capital Coast, no different? No, so absolutely. Still hitting down. Everyone's all over them. Yeah, it'd be interesting what happens now, uh, you know, with the interest rates softening, that those multi-income sort of ca high cash flow uh, properties, uh, they appeal. When I started investing, I bought a two flatter, then I bought a four flatter. Um, and this was back in the days when we had things called vacancies. Uh, and whenever I had one empty, rent kept coming in. You know, it wasn't all my rent, but there was some. So uh, there's certainly appeal to those uh, in a down renting market as let alone you know obviously around the cash flow focus. Pete all your properties in Central City will be multi-income as well yeah? Yeah I don't think I own any properties that are standalone. Oh two two properties in Stokes Valley that I'm looking to develop but they're all uh, the rest are all multi-income so I've always done that. Okay all right I think we'll wrap it up there um we've only got 20 minutes over this time last time I think we're at about 40. Thanks everyone for your questions uh, and listening in. So I'll wrap it up here. We will, uh, this has been recorded, so I'll, I'll bundle up a recording and I'll send it out to the iFind Property newsletter. Uh, if you're not on that, uh, go to ifindproperty.co.nz and you can register. Uh, we're also on Facebook. 
thanks again for joining us. Thanks to Pete and Suze for um, cancelling your trips to the beach to, um, to come on this call. Uh, and really appreciate it, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Bye now. Stay safe.